Centuries ago, Cromer was actually a long way inland. But if North Norfolk's charm is in the fact it retains an air of being timeless, it's actually an area that's been relentlessly shaped and changed by natural elements. In the early 19th century, it was believed that bathing in seawater could help cure a number of illnesses, so the fashion for sea bathing began, and the potential for fun was soon realised too. In fact, Cromer was known as a fashionable watering place as early as the 1780s, and within a century, this fast-growing resort was being frequented by many well-to-do visitors. With the advent of railways, it became an attraction for the Victorians and then the Edwardians, who built a string of grand hotels on the seafront, such as the Hotel du Paris. If you were asked to name three things that identify this wonderful Norfolk town, I would venture to say that crabs, the pier and the lifeboat would be on most people's lists. However, there is of course so much more, like quaint, beautiful streets like this, the crab and lobster festival, the fishing industry, fish and chips at Mary Jane's or number one, the West Runt and Elephant, Carnival Week, and of course, some wonderful local retailers, and the birthplace of James Dyson and the town's most distinguished lifeboatman, Henry Block. There's been a series of piers or jetties here since the 1390s. This stretch of the North Norfolk coast has no natural harbour for boats to shelter from bad weather, so man-made groins or jetties were needed for the safety of trading ships and fishing boats. The piers were probably wooden structures, possibly reinforced with stone, but acting mainly as breakwaters. Local historian and author Peter Stibbins has published extensively on the history behind the piers at Cromer. The use of the word pier, the first use in the English language that we could detect, is actually about Cromer Pier in the 1390s. So it's remarkable uh, uh, and a little, a little achievement for the town to have that word there. In 1838, that's when the promenade was built, then there was a jetty built, and that lasted through the 19th century. Unfortunately, of course, the, the gales on this coast are just unending, and every few years along they, they, they come, and those jetties of the 19th century were finally washed away, last one going in 1897, and plans began to be made for a new uh, pier, the kind of pleasure pier that had become very popular. The current pier opened on the 8th of June 1901 at a cost of £43,500. It was 500 feet in length, 40 feet wide, opening to 112 feet at the head. It was equipped with a bandstand with an encircling screen of covered seats to protect it from the wind, with the audience partly covered by an awning. The pier was lit by eight magnificent triple gas lamp standards that ran down the centre of the decking. At the entrance were two small kiosks with coupler roofs, four single gas lamps, four turnstiles, and a set of iron gates. The charge for entrance to the pier was one penny. Entertainment in those early years came from the Blue Viennese Band and the Royal Italian Band. They were often engaged at a cost of 56 pounds a week, a fee that did not rise for four years. Vocalists were added to the bill in 1904, with a promise from the chairman of the entertainments committee, Mr Alex Jarvis, the manager of the Hotel de Paris, that there would be, and I quote, no fourth or fifth rate theatrical performances, but a really good band. And if you want to sit on the original seats from the open bandstand, then you still can. In 1904, the bandstand was roofed over, followed by improvements to the stage. New tip-up seating was installed and a stage curtain added. From this bill of the 1911 season, there are a variety of vocalists, including Mr. Fred Chester, humorist entertainer, Mr. Ennis Hastings, a musical humorist, and Mr. Foden Williams, the North of England entertainer. I wonder how the Norfolk audiences got on with his accent. During the First World War, the hiring of bands ceased, but military concerts were put on instead. In 1918, the Pavilion Theatre increased its revenue by staging orchestral concerts and concert parties. 
Further improvements were made to the stage and dressing rooms in 1921, and the theatre looks very much as it does today. So here we are inside the theatre, Joe. How wonderful. So what's the current capacity? It's just over 500. Right. Um, we've got just over 70 seats upstairs in the balcony. Mm -hmm. um, so just over 400 down here. Right, right. And this is pretty much as it was 100 years ago nearly, 90 years ago. I would ago. say so, apart from the balcony, which was put in in 2004, it's looking the same as it did back then, yes. Yes, and it's had a lick of paint or two since then. Yes. yes. <laughs> so is a lot of the seating um, quite original as well? Because actually the leg room here is really marvellous. Yes, most of the seating is as old as the theatre itself. We did also used to have windows up at the very top on either side, but that's right. kind of all been blocked, blocked in to kind of make it dark and, and better for performances. And there's holes in the floor, and if you actually look down then you can see the sea. But it all adds to the atmosphere, and yeah. it, it makes it a really special place for people to come and see a show. And this leads us through to the stage manager's position and then yes, down into yes, the dressing rooms. Yes, so this is one of the exits off the stage. Right. You obviously have two, one on either side. Down into the uh, main corridor, which yes. takes us all the way into all the dressing rooms. Yeah, it's a, quite a small corridor, small dressing rooms, but yeah. um, obviously, again, we're limited because we're a peer, so, um, right. but it get, adds to the character. Everybody loves coming here. So when do you actually um, start the process of putting these big shows together? Because you've got not only the summer show, but you have the Christmas show as well. Do you literally start the week after it finishes? Well, the writing for each of those two different shows starts a couple of months ahead. Mm. Um, the actual rehearsals start two weeks before the summer show opens. Mm -hmm. So it's a really short gap of time. Like all piers and jetties, the structure at Cromer has been subject to constant battering from the natural elements, not least the high seas. The January 1953 tidal surge caused enormous damage, strewing theatre seats along the beach and dislodging many of the concert paving slabs which had replaced the wooden decking. The water rose so high in the lifeboat house that the boat was flooded and thrown against the sides, causing severe damage. There were further storms in 1976 and 1979, but no previous storm damage compared with the event that unfolded on Sunday, the 14th of November, 1993. Peter, you grew up in Cromer, so you've seen quite a few of the storms and gales that have lashed this pier. Absolutely. I mean, I remember the 1953 gale, but my grandparents wouldn't take me actually out on the day, but I can remember coming out and looking over the cliff top here the next day and seeing the, the yeah. promenade pretty much ripped up. Oh yeah, and of course, none of those gales and storms seem to compare with the famous incident from 1993. Well, that's the one that's in, that's, that's the one that's in living memory, you see. That's, that's when the barge, which was moored, where the work was being done at the West Front and Sewer, about a mile and a half out, off, out there, broke free in a November gale. She was just unstoppable. I mean, you, when you get these winter gales, the anchors fail, then uh, you've got right. nothing to do but drift. And she just went straight through uh, the pier. It was quite unstoppable. And it ended up on the beach uh, a few hundred yards the other side of the, the pier. Well, of course, uh, there are all sorts of things in place on the end of the pier. There was the lifeboat that had to be reached, so a temporary arrangement had to be made to get across there. And how long did it take to do all the repairs? When did uh, it, it was reopen? Several, it was several months before everything, uh, everything reopened uh, right. again. I mean, the, the, the district council were very prompt and on, the, uh, and on the case, but it took quite a while. So, in fact, from that time onwards, this end of the pier is quite is actually quite a new structure mm. uh, and then over the last three years there's been a lot of other work done on the on the outer part of uh, on the outer part of the pier so yeah. a lot of the pier has been renewed fortunately yeah. the commitment's been made to it over the last uh, 10 years or so standard valuation of the pier is one pound oh really because basically it's it's a net loss but once you put it into the context of, of, of tourism and visitors and so on, it, it's absolutely vital yes. uh, to the area.
And it's not just gales, tides and unmanned barges that caused damage, as in July 1940 when part of the pier was demolished as part of the UK's defence policy. So George, your family's been living in Cranmer for... 250 years. 250 years, wow. Yeah. So you're born and bred? Yeah. So just looking at July 1940, what do yeah. you remember about why they needed to blow a hole in the middle of the pier? Well, they, they, did, um, they decided that um, Germans would probably land on the uh, slipway and get, uh, come down the pier and get, get in the uh, Kromer. Right. So they decided to, to stop and they'd blow a hole in the pier. Right. Well, um, then they, uh, uh, all the locals thought the, mo the best thing to do would have been mowing the pair, and then when the Germans got on it, blow them up and <laughs> they do two jobs well, at they once. Did. So, George, this is roughly where the, the hole was blown in the yeah. pier? Yeah. Yeah. In, in here, and then because after they'd blown the hole up, they realised the lifeboat one couldn't get to the lifeboat. <laughs> so then they had made a bridge 40 inches wide right. for them. Uh, fine to come across to get to the lifeboat. Yeah. Well, in my mind, they were more at risk trying to get to the lifeboat than they were when they were out there. Yes, yes. Because they had tried to find a, a, a bridge 40 inches wide in this, this expanse in the blackout, it wasn't very easy. Yes. Because, <laughs> I mean, in the blackout, you walked at the lamppost and, uh, yeah. and apologised to trees and all sorts of things <laughs> you walked into because you didn't see them. So George, tell me a little bit about what happened actually on the day in July 1940. Army um, decided they got to blow it and uh, told everybody to open the windows to, so they didn't get uh, blown out. And uh, at two o'clock, which everybody did, but nothing happened and they carried on. Before o'clock they thought, well, nothing's got to happen, so they shut the windows. And then they blew, 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 blew half the windows out that they were supposed to be protected. <laughs> More recently, in both 2007 and 2013, there have been severe gales and high tides to cause more concern for all those that love the pier. But at the Pavilion Theatre, the show must go on. The Christmas special at Cromer Pier has also become a regular feature, and one man who's appeared is Norfolk's own legend, Ollie Day. Why do you think then there is still an appeal for an end of the pier show in the 21st century? Well, because it's that experience of walking down the pier over the ocean. Uh, sometimes in the winter, of course, you're walking down there in the dark. It's a magical place. I laugh and say, welcome to our shed on stilts. I often laugh and say that. But of course, when you're in there, it is the most magical experience. It really is. I mean, look at it. It sits there above the North Sea. And you can feel that. You really do feel it. I mean, at least now it's warm in there. We, we've got good heating. The lighting is fabulous and it's a top-notch, fully-serviced theatre. Mm. Yeah. We have jugglers, we have magicians, we have illusionists. There's top-notch dancers, some of the best in the country, and singers, there's gag people. It's the, it really is a very special experience. Yeah. yeah. some hairy moments performing in here? We have had. I mean, I've stood on the stage when the weather has been absolutely awful. I mean, the afternoon of those terrible storms that we had in 2013, and I'm standing on the stage and the light cans are going all the while the waves are crashing up against the stilts right. and the piles. That's really quite frightening, you know, and you're standing there and there's a little drop of water dropping in through the <laughs> ceiling. But uh, that's so few and far between. But it is, that is a bit hairy. I mm. said, any second now, we're, we're adrift and we'll be able to get the duty freeze out. We're only four miles away from the coast of France. <laughs> the seaward end of the pier lies the lifeboat. 
The original proposals to position it here began in 1919 and it took four years until it was complete. And the lifeboat, the HF Bailey, was first launched in service on the morning of 19th of July, 1923. The many heroic actions of the lifeboat crews are recorded throughout the town and at the Lifeboat Museum, and the names and boats are highlighted in the land end approach to the pier. Henry Blogg is perhaps the town's most distinguished crew member. By 1996, the 1920s shed had worn out. It needed replacing, so the boat was sent away for a refit, temporarily replaced by a beach launch boat, and demolition began. The new RNLI design shed was opened 18 years ago and continues to serve in this part of North Norfolk. Of course it's not just the theatre that draws people to this beautiful spot in Cromer. You can come here and enjoy your fish and chips or an ice cream, do some crabbing, see the town centre from a different angle, or indeed take in some wonderful fresh sea air. Or have a stroll along the pier.